Hey everyone, welcome to Two Car Pros. My name is Ryan, and today I'm gonna to show you exactly how to perform a compression test on an engine. So what is a compression test? That's an automotive diagnostic test on how well the cylinder is sealing. In other words, the overall health of the engine, basically on how well it can make compression, because without compression, your engine isn't gonna run. The basic rundown of this test is you need to take all the plugs out of it and then test each and every one of the plugs with the special tool I go over later and then compare the peak PSI to each other of the cylinders. This can help identify things like worn piston rings, damaged valves, or even a blown head gasket. So you might wanna run this test if you suspect that could be an issue. So if you have high compression, something near the 200s, you have a very healthy engine on all the pistons. But if you have low anywhere, something like under 100, your engine is having a problem. And if you're under 90 on just one piston, your engine's never gonna run right. And if it's under 90 on all of them, it probably won't run at all. Early detection of low compression using this video can help eliminate problems down the road, like a blown head gasket. If you catch it early, you can save your engine. So there's a couple different scenarios when it comes to a compression test results, and I go over all those at the end of the video. So with all that out of the way, let's jump in. So now that all of our plugs are out of our engine, we are nearly ready to do our compression test. The next thing we need to do is locate our fuse box. Ours happens to be right here, but yours could be anywhere. They can be in the passenger footwell, the driver footwell, or more than likely it is right here under the hood. Now, why do we need that? Well, we need to turn the fuel supply off to the engine by removing the fuel pump fuse because you don't want a bunch of unburnt fuel just hang out in the cylinders. I could leak into your oil that could fly out of the cylinders that could be dangerous and wasteful. So it's just a good idea to turn off fuel to the engine by removing that fuse. Just take that box off. There we go. So on the back of our lid here, ours is nice enough to have the fuse right there and the relay. But we're just interested in the fuse where it says 15A fuel pump in the very middle of your screen. We need to remove that 15 amp fuse and then our fuel pump shouldn't run anymore. And sometimes this info will be available in your owner's manual where that fuse is. Um, I just got lucky it might happen to be on the back of the box here. So let's just go ahead and remove this 15 amp fuse. And now our fuel pump is disabled and we can crank the engine as much as we like. The next thing I'm gonna do is an optional step, but I think it's a really good idea, is I'm gonna put on a battery tending device. This will just provide the battery with a small amount of charge as I am working on it. And you might wanna do that just because starting the engine over and over and making it turn over, over and over and over again, is a big job and it takes a decent amount of current to do that and we don't want the battery to be dead after we've done our compression test so i'm gonna hook up a battery tender it doesn't need to be like a jump start box it should just be like a regular tender it'd be just fine and i've left a link down below uh, to amazon for a fairly inexpensive one this one's only 1.5 amps so don't worry about that too much on how much current it's providing so i put the positive on the positive terminal for the battery pretty easy but for the negative i'm just going to put it on the body ground here just make sure it's a good connection like that and the reason i'm doing that is just in case this has a battery monitoring system like it can keep track of how much voltage is going to the battery at any given time this will uh basically fool it into thinking the alternator is working and not try to not compensate for the amount of voltage. Sometimes that can cause check engine lights on newer cars. So this one's old enough to where I don't think it matters too much. I do see that it does monitor that at least a little bit, but on the newer stuff, you definitely want to put the negative on a body ground. So now we're free to crank the engine over and it should spin really fast. This is what we want uh, with minimal effort on the starter and the charging system. Now this will cause check engine lights more likely than not. You're just gonna have to ignore them and erase the codes later. So I don't have anything hooked up yet. I just want to verify that it'll crank. So you can see it just cranks really, really quickly, really easily. This is exactly what we want. That's perfect. So here is what is actually going to test the pressure in the cylinders. That is our automotive compression gauge set. Ours is made by Snap-on. No, you don't need the Snap-on unit. I happen to have one because I am a professional and I need professional tools and I use this all the time. You can rent one from the auto parts store for literally free or buy an inexpensive one off of Amazon. And I've provided a link down below in the description for your convenience. So they all pretty much look like this. Take them out and you'll have a selection of these tubes. And these tubes are actually what go in the cylinder head and sort of mock being a spark plug. But instead of igniting fuel, they feed pressure into the gauge. Now, I just happen to know that this one is the one we need for our car. And the way you can check that is the different threads on here. 
is you compare it to the spark plug thread and you can see that they are exactly the same. Typically with spark plugs, there's just the big one and the little one. Typically, most cars are the bigger one, the M14 and not the M12 typically, but compare your spark plug to the threads to make double shore. And then that has a quick connect fitting on the end of it that goes into the gauge itself that is going to do all the magic for us. So let's get into how we use it. So we're gonna take our threaded adapter piece and put it onto our spark plug threads. Make sure it's not cross threaded. It's really easy to do, especially with aluminum. There we go. And then there's no like tool or anything. That's why the end of the uh, adapter here is knurled because you just put it on, you know, finger tight like that. And then we can grab our gauge. It's just like an air hose line pulled back on this collet and insert it firmly into our adapter piece. Make sure it doesn't come apart. That's excellent. And then we have our gauge right here and it is ready for cranking to show us how much PSI the cylinder is generating when cranking. Okay, so now we're ready to crank the engine over. Make sure your hands aren't anywhere where the engine is going to move, like in the serpentine belt. I have a helper in the driver's seat and they're gonna crank it for me. And they're gonna crank it for about five seconds. You don't wanna just bump it over. It needs to really go through an entire cycle of the compression cycle. A way to guarantee that is if you just crank it for five seconds. So go ahead. And there we go, we got our maximum rating of nearly 200. We're at like 195 PSI. That is absolutely perfect. And I'm gonna write down our results. And then I'm gonna do the exact same thing for the other cylinders. So I went ahead and did the exact same test on all the other cylinders, all six of them. Obviously, if you had an eight cylinder, you'd have two more. And if you had an inline four, you'd have two less. But I wanted to go over our rating. So we have 200, 198, 201, 200, 199, and 202. That is a very healthy engine. That is a very robust engine. There is nothing wrong with this. If your ratings are like this, where they are all reasonably high, like north of 150, and they're all within 10 PSI of each other, you have a perfectly fine engine. This is probably not your problem. But let's go over what you would find if there was a problem. So what if you do all the compression testing and everything turns out okay except for this one. You have a troublemaker here. It's making about half what the other ones are and your numbers can be a little bit different. They probably will be. But you'll notice there's one that is way down on PSI. Basically what happens there is you either have a hole in the piston, the valves aren't sealing, or a piston ring isn't happy and it's not doing its job. So those are what goes wrong when you have one out of the bunch ruining the whole engine. The next thing that goes wrong is you'll test it and you'll have two next to each other that are low and exactly the same. Typically what that means is there's a blown head gasket in between these two. So they're sharing low pressure together and that's a big problem. And here's the funny thing about that problem. Your engine will most likely test fine for a blown head gasket. All the tests will say no, but this test says yes and it's right because there's no coolant involved. There won't be any oil in the coolant. Nothing will appear wrong except there is a blown head gasket between the two and that's important info to know. So the next scenario that happens is you have a uniform engine, but everything's pretty darn low. A thing we found that happens is the camshaft has jumped a tooth on the timing chain or timing belt or whatever it happens. And you have a camshaft correlation code where it'll either read high or it'll read low. And you'll think, well, the sensor's broken. You put a new sensor in, it still reads high or low. That's because you have a mechanical problem and the timing for the camshaft and the crankshaft are out of sync and that will give you low compression and the engine won't run right. The check engine light will never turn off and this is your problem right here. So you need to adjust your timing. So you most likely have to readjust your timing chain or probably you need a new timing set. And here is our final what if scenario. What if all of them are reading low uniformly like this? Anything under 95, you really need 90 PSI for an engine to light off. But if you have fuel, you have air, you have spark, this is the next thing I would test. And you will most likely find that you have very low compression like this. And if that's the instance, the engine's done. It has done its job. It's time for a new one or a rebuild. There is no fix for this, but a new engine, unfortunately. So if you have this scenario, it's time for a new motor. 
So that's how to do an automotive compression test. This is a very easy thing to do. You don't need a lift or anything. You can rent the tool for free or you can find an inexpensive one on Amazon. Like I said, and all the links are located down below in the description. This is a vital automotive test that you're probably going to pay $300 or so just to have performed on your vehicle, depending on the car or truck. And it's really helpful to understand what is going on with this test and better understand what kind of condition your engine is in. I can even see using this test to verify the condition of a used car. Just because a used car says it has 80,000 miles on it, doesn't mean they didn't swap a really old engine into it and it actually has like 300,000 miles on it, but the compression test never lies. So I could see that as well. Thank you so very much for watching. If you like what I do here and you wanna support the channel directly, you can click that join button down below. That is a direct way to do that. Otherwise, a like, comment, and subscription go a long way in the YouTube algorithm, and I really appreciate it. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you next time.